Well, good afternoon, everyone, and Happy New Year to, to all of you. I, uh, I know that this is the first time that we have been together in 2021, and uh, we're all relieved to, I know, put 2020 behind us. I want you to know that we begin this new year with optimism. After many hard months, we can finally see a path forward for the world, for this great country of ours, and for our commonwealth. As you know, two vaccinations are now available and more are being developed. These vaccines are literally our path forward. They are good. They are safe. I will take them. My family will take them, and I would encourage all of you to take them as well. Taking a vaccine is the right thing to protect your own health and also to protect other people. It's the way to stop this virus. It's our path forward to recovery, and it's the clearest way we're going to get back to something that feels like normal. But we all need to be clear that our country is in a very, very serious place right now. The virus is worse now than it has ever been. Case numbers are about four times higher than they were last spring. We had the highest case number every day, and we can expect it to go higher. In fact, the UVA model shows that cases could keep rising until Valentine's Day or even later. So we have a long winter ahead of us. We also need to be clear that new strains of the virus are out there. They're much more contagious than what we've seen so far. They're out in the world, and while we have not seen it yet in Virginia, it will surely make its way here, if not already so. So we have more hard work ahead for several weeks and months. For 10 months now, we have had just a few tools in our toolbox. You all know what they are. Staying at home, which I have encouraged everybody to do, wearing a mask, washing our hands, staying six feet apart. I know it's no fun, but we need to keep it up, and I cannot overemphasize that. Then, 22 days ago, our country got the most powerful tool, the one that's going to literally change things. We're now three weeks into the most extensive public vaccination campaign in modern history. It involves science and medicine, researchers and doctors. It depends on regulators studying every piece of data to protect your safety and to make sure that the vaccination works. It involves highly complex advanced manufacturing. It requires moving supplies around the world and storing much of it at super cold sub-zero temperatures. This is complex stuff. And everything depends on thousands of health care providers. And I want to assure you that they are working very hard, night and day, and despite being tired and, quite frankly, worn out, they are literally our heroes. But we know how to do hard things in this country, don't we? It takes brains and it takes heart to do a tough job. And a little bit of luck doesn't hurt either. We've got all of that in this country. And we're summoning it right now to get this job done. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Because... Your country, our country, needs your help to move past this pandemic. You have an important job to do. So I want to tell you what you need to do, when you need to do it, and how it all fits into the larger plan. You deserve to know that as well. So let's start with the numbers, like we always do. Today, we're looking at a few different numbers, and let's start with the big ones. The first number that you need to know 
is 8.5 million. That's about how many people live in our commonwealth. The second number you need to know is two. That's how many doses each person will need to receive. You get one shot first, then another one a few weeks later. When you multiply those numbers, you get 17 million. That's how many shots it will take to vaccinate everyone in our commonwealth. So here's how we're going to get there. Right now, Virginia is receiving about 110,000 doses a week. Our first step is to use up all of that supply to completely wipe out that supply because we know that the supply will be replenished. That works out to about 14,000 doses a day. We're close to that now. In fact, today we added another 12,000 doses to that list. So we are on track. So next, we'll move to a clear goal, 25,000 shots a day. That's our next goal. And hitting it will depend on manufacturing ramping up and supplies being distributed to states over time. We don't have everything we need yet. No state does because it's being manufactured literally in real time. That's consistent with the short-term goal that President-elect Biden has laid out for our country. But to get all Virginians two shots later this year, we know we'll have to double that. So let's talk about that. It will take a moment to achieve this. We're not going to get there tomorrow. We all learned that months ago when it became clear how important testing would be. Back then, we were testing about 5,000 individuals a day. And we said we need to double it. We set a goal of testing 10,000 people a day. And we all celebrated when we hit it. And then we hit it again, and we kept hitting it over and over again. Today, we routinely test double that sometime triple that or even more. Today, it's nothing to see 30,000 tests, 40,000 tests, sometimes even 50,000 tests a day in Virginia. We set a goal with testing, and we hit it. So we've proven that when we set a goal, that we'll achieve it. But it will take a moment to build up to. So let's acknowledge why that's true. And now that we have a baseline, we can ramp it up. We can be faster, and we're going to be faster. That starts with a simple message to health care providers, health departments, hospitals, clinics, pharmacies, everywhere. You use it or you lose it. So I want you to empty those freezers and get shots in arms. When you have vials, give out shots until they're gone. No one wants to see any supplies sitting unused. The companies are manufacturing more. They're working around the clock, and you're going to get more. So don't save anything. You're going to get every dose you need because more is coming. But if you're not using what you receive, you must be getting too much. So in the next shipment, we're going to allocate more doses to other places that need them. These numbers are going to be public so that everyone can see what supply is out there, where the doses are being deployed, and how quickly. Virginians, you deserve this transparency, and that's going to take a moment too. Over the past three weeks, everyone has been focused on getting shots in arms. It's taken a moment for reporting to catch up and for different computer systems to feed seamlessly into the Commonwealth Central Data Portal for immunization. I'm confident this will be seamless in just a few days. Now, I want to be clear. Use it or lose it does not mean know that you go give shots to everyone who shows up. There's a clear prioritization of who should get shots first and who should get them in what order. P 
people most at risk go first. We all know what that means. Healthcare professionals are first in line. People who care for people who are sick, they're most at risk. And if they get sick, then no one is left to care for everyone else. So nurses, EMTs, doctors, they're in group 1A. Then the next group of people who are at risk are people who live in our long-term care facilities, places like nursing homes and assisted living. They're at risk for reasons that we all know, and we've seen the facts. More than 30,000 people have died from COVID in the United States. About 40, over 300,000, thank you, about 40% of them lived in nursing homes or assisted living centers. These are our parents, our grandparents, and people we love, people who just need a little extra help. That's why they are at the top of the list. Together, these groups represent about 500,000 people. Next on the list are essential workers. This is group 1B. So let's talk about what that means. Every worker is important, but certainly these are people who work in jobs that keep our society functioning, people who are at higher risk of exposure to COVID-19, and people who cannot work remotely. So let me give you just a few examples. These are firefighters. These are police officers and hazmat workers. These are grocery store workers and people who work in plants processing the food that everyone eats. You don't eat unless these folks go to work. This group includes bus drivers and transit workers, the people who run the systems that help other people get to work. So if you rely on the metro or the bus to get to work and there's no one to drive it, then you're out of luck and your family suffers. That's why these workers are so high on the list of essential workers. And it includes folks in food and agriculture, corrections, and mail carriers. This list has been developed based on guidance the CDC has given to all states. It's good guidance, and it's clear guidance. It also allows room for states to customize. We've done that in Virginia after consulting with healthcare professionals, experts in medical ethics, and lots of others. So I want everyone to understand one of the most important ways we are prioritizing who gets vaccinated. The largest group of frontline essential workers are our teachers, our child care workers, and anyone who works in K through 12 school. Let's be clear about this, too. We all love teachers, and we value the work that they do to educate our children. But they're not high on the list just because we like them. They're high on the list of essential workers because teachers are critical to getting schools back open. And that's critical to people getting back to work and and literally getting back to normal. Opening schools doesn't depend on vaccinating teachers, but that sure will make it a lot easier. So that's why we've chosen to put teachers so high on the list of essential workers. Now, let me take a step back. This prioritization is very complex, like everything dealing with COVID has been. Everyone I just described is in groups 1A and 1B. This group also includes people aged 75 and older. Together, this is about 2 million people, and that's a lot of Virginians. So let's do that math. Once we ramp up, I'll take well into the springtime. It will take well into the springtime to get all of these folks the two shots that they require. Then after that is the next group of essential workers, people who work in transportation, food service, construction, energy, and more. It also includes everyone aged 65 and over, and that's about another two and a half million people. All of these groups make up the first phase of our vaccination program, and remember, we have prioritized it this way. People who are most at risk first, then move quickly to essential workers whose jobs can help get everyone back to work and back to normal again. Everyone I just went through is in the first big group, 
Altogether, this is more than half of Virginia. And it really gets complex between groups A, B, and C. There aren't always clear lines between different subgroups of essential workers. So back to my message to everyone doing the vaccinating. Move quickly, please. Empty those freezers, clear those shelves, deploy those doses, show us shots in Virginia's arms. Follow the priority list. It's about fairness and equity, and it's very, very important. But please, you are allowed to use your judgment. If you need to make adjustments now and then, do it. We need to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible. This is all a lot of work, and we have to step up our game right when everyone is exhausted. Months of work around the clock with no time off and endless stress has left everyone spent and worn out. Our local health departments need help, and I want everyone in public health to know you are doing tremendous work. Virginia deeply appreciates it, and we're sending you help. So today, I'm appointing Dr. Danny T.K. Avula to lead Virginia's vaccination program. Many of you know Dr. Avula. He leads the Richmond and Henrico Health Departments. He is a board-certified physician and a specialist in pediatrics, like some of the best doctors I know. <laughs> he studied at UVA and VCU he completed residencies there and at Johns Hopkins. He has been named one of Richmond's top docs seven years in a row, and local newspapers named him Person of the Year last year and the year before. He's a good man. He knows how to get things done, and he's the right person to bring extra help to our local health departments. He will be our field general, coordinating work between state officials local health departments, hospitals, and private providers. He'll be working hand in glove with our team, who you know well, especially our health commissioner, Dr. Norm Oliver, Dr. Lori Forlano, Dr. Lillian Peek, Christy Gray, and everyone at the Virginia Department of Health. They are doing great work. As more doses arrive in Virginia, we will assign the National Guard to help with vaccinations. And Dr. Avula and this team will work with our military team to help coordinate where the National Guard goes and when they go there. And he will be part of the team you see here regularly with me to keep you informed and up to speed about the progress we're making toward our goal of 50,000 shots a day. You're going to see a lot of us in the new year. I know you have a lot of questions. People want to know, when is my turn, and when it is my turn, where do I go? I laid out the broad categories a minute ago, and we will have a lot more specifics in the days and weeks to come. But remember, we're three weeks and two days into this, and we're focusing on people who are, who are most at risk first. So your turn is coming. But for now, unless you work in health care or live or work in a nursing home, you don't do anything. It's not yet your turn, but it will be soon. As that time gets closer over the next month, we'll be rolling out online tools to let you know where shots are available and how that you can get them. When your turn comes around, you need to be ready, and we'll make sure you have the information you need ahead of time. So you will be able to see a list of events, locations, and times. You'll be able to sign up online or by phone. We'll be going into the community and turning to trusted community leaders to help get the word out. These vaccines are really important, and we are personally committed to earning your trust. I know many of you have an even more important question, and that is, is this vaccine safe? And should I take it? My answer to you is yes. I believe that with all my heart. 
based on years of experience as a doctor. I will take it when it is my turn, and so will my family. I have full confidence in the process to develop the vaccines. Yes, it has moved quickly, but that's because the whole world went all in on developing the vaccines. It's not something to be worried about. It's, it's a success story in a year that didn't have very many. I say that as a physician and as someone who has participated in more than 200 clinical trials over the years. I am confident that the proper process was followed for these vaccines, and I want you to know that I believe that. I also know that you believe in the old adage, trust but verify and you want to hear from the most trusted man in the country. And who would that be? That's Dr. Anthony Fauci. I want you to talk to him, and I want you to listen to him. So please join us at 3 p.m. on Friday, this Friday, for an online question and answer hour with Dr. Anthony Fauci. Our health equity team and VCUs Massey Cancer Center have put this together so that Virginians can listen and learn. You can watch it live on our governor's office social media channel, so please plan to tune in. With that, I would like to ask Dr. Avula and also welcome Dr. Avula uh, to say a few words and then we'll be glad to respond to your questions. Dr. Avula, welcome. Thank you, Governor Northam, and hello, everybody. Really excited to uh, have this opportunity to serve with this incredible administration. Um, uh, obviously, I've been really close to the work on the ground in Richmond and Henrico over the last year, um, and I think when I uh, received the call and uh, talked to my colleagues, Mayor Stoney and County Manager Votulkas, uh, they both recognized uh, the value of better state and local integration. And so my hope in this short-term assignment uh, is to come alongside Commissioner Oliver and the uh, amazing team that is uh, driving this work at VDH um, to help build some more of those bridges between the work that's happening locally uh, and the work that's happening centrally um, and, and really get after vaccinating Virginia. Uh, and, and none of this could be possible without the um, incredible team that we've assembled in the Richmond and Henrico Health departments uh, who have just done such phenomenal work over the, the last year and are willing to stand in the gap for these next few months as I, uh, I share my time here uh, w with this team. So thank you, Governor Northam, and, and thank you all. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. Be glad to address your questions. Mel. Hi, yeah, you can get um, vaccinations and testing, and you said, you know, the state has set a goal for testing, and eventually we got there. I think the difference to me is that testing was an all-of-a-sudden challenge. We didn't have testing. It was a new virus. I think with vaccines, we definitely saw this coming. Um, what are some of the challenges we didn't or couldn't foresee on vaccines? Um, and I'll just tack on a second closely uh, related question. I think some of the hospitals and facilities feel that um, maybe they didn't get enough guidance. Uh, can, you, can you speak to that? You know, Mel, there are a lot of challenges, um, as, as you probably know. Um, I, uh, I would just start by saying that uh, we have vaccinated in, in three weeks uh, a little bit over 115,000 uh, individuals in, in Virginia. I'm happy to say that 2,000 of those have already received their second vaccination. So, so we're making progress, but there is no question that we need to, I think, speed the uh, process up. We need to get more uh, Virginians vaccinated. That's clear. The challenges, quite frankly, are, are challenges that are not unique to Virginia. I think if you look at the data uh, across our country, uh, and I speak with governors frequently, uh, we're all facing the same challenges. And so, you know, when, when we see these challenges, we have to take action. And that's why I'm here today, and that's some of the announcements that I made today. Uh, number one, we're setting goals, um, and they're goals that are achievable. Um, as, as I've said, we're, uh, we're going to uh, make sure that no doses uh, are, are not being given to patients, uh, to, to Virginians. Uh, we're going to ramp up to 25,000. That's certainly our first goal. And, and by the way, that's supply dependent. Um, that's one of the challenges. Uh, we need the doses. Um, and we have a partner in, in Washington um, who will help us receive those doses. Uh, I am very close to the congressional delegation. They have been working. We need the funding. 
uh, which they've been able to give us. So, so 25,000 is certainly our, our next step. And then after that, in order to get to 8.5 million Virginians vaccinated and having two uh, doses of the vaccination, uh, we're going to need to get to 50,000. And we're going to do that as soon as we can uh, with Dr. Avula's help and, and continue the, the mechanisms that are in place. Um, and that's what we need to do uh, to make sure that all Virginians are vaccinated. And we'd like to do that by uh, have all Virginians vaccinate, certainly by the summertime, and, and finally get this pandemic behind us. Yes, sure. Dr. Carey. Sure. Uh, the question was whether uh, were we uh, the guidance that was given to the health care systems initially, uh, what has been that experience and, and uh, or do we think that uh, we need to revise that, I think is the question. And we have gotten feedback. We're, we work through the Virginia Hospital and Health Care Association, the, the VDMAC, the Virginia Disaster Medical Advisory Committee, as well as personal conversations literally every day with health systems as well as health departments around the Commonwealth. How is it working on the ground? And again, the, the plan we've been working on for 10 months, but then when it hits reality and it has to be operationalized, that's where great learning occurs. And that's not a weakness, that's a strength. And one of the specific feedbacks that we got was that we had 1A, but then there was the first group with those who are in the intensive care units. Of course, the nurses and respiratory therapists and the doctors, those should be the first. It made sense, but in fact, over the last two or three weeks, they said, you know, why don't we just have 1A and let us do all 1A at one time? And the governor's comments about that flexibility and getting shots in arms is exactly that. Do the, do the right thing as you go through the priority list. And I'll, I'll give a, another example that uh, consistent with what the governor just said, that talking with the health system this morning, some small counties, they're trying to plan an event for their health care workers outside of the hospital. But it's a pretty small county, and, and that is a relatively small group. Wouldn't it be much more efficient to look at that first part of, of 1B that the governor indicated, sheriffs, police, teachers, uh, correctional officers, couldn't they arrange an event, but that's in 1B, are we allowed to do that? And the answer is yes, if it, if it leads to operational efficiency and using our plan to its utmost to get the maximum number of doses in Virginians' arms. So there's an example that's not going to 1B statewide, but it's an, a local operational decision and that flexibility and judgment that the governor mentioned. So we are communicating that in response to what the, the vaccinators are telling us, that, that hey, we want, we want to follow the rules, but, and we don't want to break them, but we, we want to go faster too. So that is a good example of the governor's comments around flexibility as we move forward together. Hello, good afternoon. Um, so, Governor, are you aware of any health systems not using the vaccine they received or vaccines going to waste? I mean, what's with the um, use it or lose it um, approach? Uh, you know, it seems kind of um, almost aggressive in a way. Yeah, thank you, Alan, for that. And the question is, are we aware of any doses that are not being used that are, uh, I guess you would ask, having to be disposed of? And to date, we haven't been. Uh, but we, we are just making the point, uh, Alan, that uh, when, when we allocate a certain number of doses to, for example, a, a hospital or, or whatever clinic, uh, whatever site we are, are using out in the community, if those doses aren't being used and, and the next request is they're not going to get the, the number and they're going to go elsewhere where they are being used. So that's, it's just a plan of, of being more efficient. Um, there are also, you know, there are examples of uh, when we set up sites, uh, whether it be in the hospital or, or wherever, um, if the number of individuals don't show up uh, to receive the vaccination, then we're obviously going to have uh, doses left over. And, and so we don't want that to happen. And one of the points that I would make because of that is we move forward with this and, and get uh, into phase 1B and then finally into the general population. I hope that everybody will follow the, the news, to follow the announcements, uh, where these sites are going to be available, and, and really take the opportunity to be ready. 
um, and so when your time comes that, that you can get in, uh, keep your appointment, get your vaccination, and then get your follow-up vaccination three weeks later. That is going to be very, very important. So, so we're going to request your help uh, as we move forward with this. You're all going to be part of the solution. Aside from saying hurry up to the hospitals and local health departments, what else can you do to uh, increase the vaccination rate? And then just to follow up from yesterday on the school's conversation with the Secretary of State, Absolutely. I want to answer your, your second question first. And uh, we have had a lot of discussion uh, regarding uh, educating our children. I think we all agree, uh, whether it be our children or whether it be families or our teachers, that, that we want to get our children back in school. Uh, we want to do it safely and, and responsibly. And, and so we're going to move forward with that, and I, I will have some comments. Uh, we just want to really focus today on, on the vaccination process and how we can make that uh, uh, more expeditious. Uh, one of the things that I announced, though, as you probably heard today, is that teachers uh, are going to be a, a top priority. Uh, we want to make sure that all teachers that you know, are willing to receive the vaccination uh, are able to receive that uh, so that we can keep them and, as well as other staff members. Uh, also looking at a lot of other things, Henry, um, and I don't want to get into to, too much detail, uh, but uh, our, our children have suffered. Uh, from COVID-19, uh, as have our families. And one of the things that we certainly are, are entertaining is, is looking at uh, perhaps a year-round year schooling uh, for the next year, perhaps adding uh, increased days uh, this summer to really help our kids get caught up. So a lot of good work is going on in that regard. Again, the bottom line, we want to get our children back in school. We want to do it safely and, and responsibly. And I'll, I'll have more to say. Uh, the Department of Education, uh, our Secretary of Education, uh, our Superintendent of Public Instruction, a lot of uh, effort has gone into this, and we'll be making further comments uh, soon. The, the first question you had is, you know, how can we uh, encourage uh, hospitals to uh, be more efficient or give more doses? And, and I think that's one of the, the, the themes of the, the topic today is that, you know, I think we've gotten off to a good start. Uh, in the first three weeks, uh, we've, we've vaccinated over 115,000 individuals, but we need to do it faster. And so we're going to work with the hospitals. We're going to work with the health departments. We're going to work with the sites, the clinics uh, uh, out in the communities. And, and uh, we really feel that we can, uh, you know, be more expeditious and, and get more shots in arms. And the reason we're doing this is, uh, and I'm committed to it, uh, that's what will put this pandemic in the rearview mirror. And I just, want, again, want to emphasize that with, with all the listeners, all Virginians, that we're all part of this solution and uh, get ready because uh, we're getting ready. Uh, and we're going to, uh, as soon as we can get the doses that we need, uh, as I mentioned, we're getting a little bit over 110,000 uh, a week. Uh, we need more doses. We have a partner in, in Washington. Uh, we can use the Defense Production uh, Act uh, in order to provide more doses. But uh, we're all, all a part of this team, and uh, we want to get the uh, pandemic behind us. Bruce Potter, Inside Nova. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, Governor, and thank you for uh, taking the questions. Um, two very specific questions for you. Number one, um, good goals need a timeline. What is the, what is the timeline or expectation for getting to 25,000 and then 50,000 doses a week, uh, assuming that they are available. And then secondly, um, I think I heard you say, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, the health department would be releasing more information, more details about um, where the vaccines were going to be distributed to. And I wondered if you could provide a couple more details on exactly uh, what kind of information is going to be released there. Thank you. No, two great questions, and I, I think it, the, your second question goes to uh, when I can get the vaccine and where, and, and the, the, you know, the public messaging that will go into that. And I'll, I'll let uh, Dr. Oliver handle that and talk in a little bit more detail. The, the first is uh, the question was when will we hit 25,000 and, and when will we hit 50,000? And there are a lot of factors that uh, uh, contribute to that, and, and my answer would be as soon as we can. Uh, we, again, want to do this safely and, and responsibly. A lot of it uh, will be supply dependent, and I, I think I've made that point uh, already. But in order to get to 25,000 and especially to 50,000, we need more doses coming into Virginia. So we'll work on that. I think the other thing that I would like to say that is, is very encouraging 
um, and, and that is the help that we've gotten uh, at the federal level uh, from the, the recent uh, relief package that was signed by our president. And I, I meet with our congressional delegation uh, usually once a week. Uh, we have a very good uh, open line of communication, and, and I've told them why we need help, what help we need, and in what uh, particular areas we need that. Um, I proposed $90 million, for example, in our budget uh, that the legislature will be working on uh, just a, a week from now. Uh, federally, we're receiving over $100 million. So that's going to be very helpful as we deploy this vaccination. So, uh, and there are a lot of other things that that relief package does as well. So, you know, we're all in this together. We're getting uh, good assistance uh, from, uh, from Washington, uh, from our congressional delegation. So it's, as soon as we have the doses, our plan here is to be able to ramp this up and, and uh, all this will come to uh, fruition. So that's, that's the plan. Yes. I didn't mean to leave you out. I'm sorry. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. <clears throat> the uh, second question uh, related to how will the uh, uh, health department get information out for uh, 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 people in the Commonwealth to be able to sign up and uh, find out when and where they can get their um, uh, COVID-19 vaccination. Um, we have more than 2,000 providers who have already been uh, registered with uh, CDC and are prepared to be um, vaccinators. We have currently uh, well north of 120 uh, MOUs with pharmacies across the Commonwealth so that they can uh, provide that. Uh, federally qualified uh, community health centers who stand ready to uh, become vaccinators. And so tomorrow, if we were to uh, decide that we wanted to order vaccine and move into uh, 1B across the Commonwealth, we could order vaccine tomorrow. It would be here on Monday and we could uh, begin doing that. So uh, we are ready, at, uh, and when we get to that point, we'll be able to get that information out directly to the public on our site. We are currently uh, setting up um, um, software whereby individuals can pre-register uh, for uh, vaccinations. We'll be working with their uh, community-based providers so they'll be uh, areas where they can go. This information will be uh, published on our website. We'll do a massive uh, media campaign around it, uh, social media, and other uh, means to let people know where they can go uh, become uh, vaccinated. And hopefully this will be something that will be occurring in uh, weeks. Okay. Governor, I wonder if, um, if you're, how concerned you are about some of the higher numbers that continue to come from the state and if you're worried about hospitalizations and then specifically if you look at the events uh, going on up in D.C. today, if you think that that could be a super spreader event. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Two, two questions. Let, let me answer the uh, second part of your question. I, I regret it's very disappointing what is going on right now at our nation's capital and, and I, absolutely when people are out and uh, not using the distancing, not using masks, and obviously it can contribute to more spread of this virus. I would also make the point that um, I have been in touch with the mayor of Washington. Uh, obviously, we have our National Guard here in Virginia, and if there's anything that we can do to support uh, her in that mission, we will certainly do that. Um, as far as the numbers, Greg, uh, they're very concerning to me. Uh, we had over 5,000 new cases today, over 30 additional deaths. And it's something that I get up and I, I look at that data uh, every morning. Uh, as you know, uh, we, have, uh, we have put uh, some significant mitigation measures uh, in place. I think everybody is uh, aware of those, the, the limiting the, the size of social gatherings, the, the mandate for both indoor and outdoor masks, the, the curfew after uh, midnight. And we'll continue to follow those and encourage Virginians to follow those guidelines. And I think part of your question was, I think, really where the the rubber meets the road, and uh, Dr. Carey uh, and I and our, our commissioner are in, in constant communication with our hospitals. Uh, we uh, need to know what their capacities are, uh, do need to know how their staffing uh, is going, uh, need to know whether they have uh, shifted to uh, eliminate or postpone elective surgery. So, so we have that communication uh, on, a, on a daily basis. And um, we, if, uh, if we need to take further measures to, to mitigate these numbers, all options on the table, and, and we will certainly do that. Um, I'm Elise 
Wecker, ABC 13 News. Hello, Governor. My question for you is why have some other states been able to begin vaccinating the public, but that has not yet happened in Virginia? And when do you expect that to happen in the Commonwealth? I'm sorry, they, other states have been able to vaccinate the public. The public. Okay, well, I, I guess every, every state uh, maybe does things a little bit differently, but we're obviously going to fo follow the procedures or the uh, protocol that, that uh, we have in place. And Again, the, uh, there's, there's a lot of, uh, I think, discussion and, and logic and reasoning behind what we're doing uh, in Virginia. Obviously, we want to get out to the folks that are most at risk first, and those are the, our frontline health care workers uh, and individuals that uh, live and work in our nursing homes. And then we will uh, expand the vaccination program from there, just as, as I described earlier. <laughs> okay, just checking in here. You, the mask is muffled a little. So obviously, as you've mentioned, one B and one C are huge groups of people. So I'm wondering, has the state set guidelines for prioritizing certain professions within that group? Um, and if you could speak a little bit more to how you're actually going to go through getting those out to to people. Do you want to address uh, the, the different groups? I think sure. we've kind of gone over those, but uh, yeah, if you want, to, yes. Maybe the commissioner can help can follow up as, follow up as well. So the question was really the, the, the guiding principle of the 1B, separate than the high risk patient group, um, age greater than 75, uh, and the others uh, that you'll you'll see, uh, is on frontline essential workers. Those that because of where outbreaks have been, where uh, if they do their job, they cannot socially distance. They have to be in contact with the public or each other. And then those that are in 1C, the essential worker group also, it's, it's the subgroup of those workers that can't do it from home. So it's not uh, whether it's transportation workers or, or whatever other group you'll t you want to talk about, but if you can do it safely from your home, if you're in accounting and doing a great job um, socially distancing and working remotely, then uh, that is, that you're not in that group. You would be in the, the general population. So... Uh, we'll be giving more, much more concrete guidance as we uh, get closer to getting into 1B, and, and that will be in the, the days ahead as to when that guidance is going to go out. And I'll ask Dr. Oliver, excuse me, yeah, Dr. Oliver to uh, maybe add some additional. Jackie, the, the other part of your question is how are we going to organize to... Um, so as the uh, governor uh, mentioned in his uh, remarks, what we want to do is to f uh, follow the prioritization because that's been well thought through by our uh, advisory uh, work group, our health equity uh, work group, uh, the Virginia uh, Medical Advisory Council, and, and our medical ethicists and so on. We feel that this will help us be fair and equitable in the distribution but we don't want it to be a roadblock to our being able to, uh, in a very efficient manner, vaccinate as many people as we possibly can as quickly as we can. So having that framework means that, yes, you should follow the order, but if you have two people who are in, higher up in the list and there's 10 others who are down the list a little bit and you have 20 doses, that, vaccinate them all, right? There should be some flexibility there for the vaccinators, and, and that's an important point to get across. So try and, um, we want them to follow the prioritization, but there needs to be flexibility there so that they can do so uh, in an efficient manner. Uh, we have the providers for reaching all of those people. You mentioned uh, the numbers. Um, a lot of that will be what we call closed uh, points of dispensing, so that you can go to where... The law, you can go to the uh, law enforcement agency and do a vac uh, vaccination clinic right there. There are other places where uh, we'll probably wind up um, doing uh, uh, like a community kind of site. Uh, if you're doing grocery store workers or something, you may not be able to uh, rely upon the employer to set up a closed pod. Um, we're working on the, that now. Uh, we will, um, our local health departments and the uh, healthcare systems are 
beginning to have those discussions to set these things up because we believe that we will be moving to this um, phase in, in short order. Set prioritization yet ordering like first first responders, then child care, then K through 12 teachers. Like, or I see what you're saying about the flexibility, but have we gotten that granular yet? Yes. Yeah, so um, later on today, in about 15 minutes, um, we will be uh, posting um, the uh, spe specifics on Plan One B, uh, Phase One B, and One C. It'll be on the website, and yes, uh, there is a priority list for both phases. Happy New Year to you, Andre. Could you update us on uh, some of your efforts to reach minorities who still say they are not going to take the vaccine? And then on, on sidebar, my second question is, I, I, we noticed that you've been traveling throughout the Commonwealth to assist different agencies and businesses and organizations. But, Governor, there are still a number of people who are saying they can't get to a human being on the phone to file for their unemployment. They can't get calls back. So people are wondering, why wouldn't the governor put more time and energy and money into the website to help struggling Virginians? Yeah, I'm going to have Dr. Healy come up and, and answer your, your second question, but I, I will uh, entertain your, your first question and, and answer that as best I can. And that's something, Andre, that is, the, I think, the, the trust issue uh, across Virginia with you know, uh, receiving the vaccination. Uh, is it effective? Is it safe? Uh, um, and I certainly understand the history, and I, I understand the, the question of, of trust there. And we, we dealt with a lot of that actually during the testing. Um, and one of the things that, that we did to address that, one of several things, was to, to form our Health Equity Commission. Uh, Dr. Janice Underwood uh, leads that. Um, and that worked in several different areas. One, it, it worked to establish sites, testing sites, and we'll do the same thing. Uh, with our communities, uh, with the vaccinations. We'll be going out to the communities with, with mobile units. There will also be sites out there that will be established where individuals that can that have the transportation uh, will be able to get to those. So that's, that's obviously very uh, important to us. And then we'll continue to work with our community leaders and, and especially our, our faith leaders. They were very helpful when it came to the trust issue with, with testing, and, and we've been in contact. Uh, uh, Janice has been in contact, and, and we'll continue that dialogue and, and uh, ask for their assistance uh, as we, we move forward. Uh, but, you know, if you look at the numbers, Andre, uh, you know, about 60 percent of the population has said they're willing to receive the vaccination. I would like to see it higher. Uh, quite frankly. So uh, Dr. Avula and I and Dr. Carey and Dr. Holler, we'll be working on that uh, with Dr. Underwood and, and the rest of our staff and community leaders to really get that message out there that, one, it's safe and also how important it is. If we all want to get back to our, our near normal lives, we want to get our kids back in school, we want to get our businesses open again. And in order to do that, we've got to get this pandemic under control and get uh, the, a large percentage of the population uh, vaccinated, and so we can move forward. So we'll keep working on that. Anna Lay, Virginia Pilot. Oh, hey, Elena. We were going to have Dr. Healy address the unemployment. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Healy. So, so the question was around unemployment insurance and, and the communication between the Employment Commission as well as the, the claimants. Um, so in November, we are taking over 100,000 calls uh, per week, uh, which is an ultimate goal through our call center. Uh, we actually saw a decline in December. It was around 60,000, so there was some room. But we know it's still struggle because a lot of people call at the same time first thing in the morning. Uh, so Monday, we implemented a callback feature. So now everyone can call and that you, instead of waiting on the phone in line, that someone will call you back within that day or the next day. And so we're, uh, we're happy that we've moved to that. Communication, Governor Northam asked the commissioner of the Employment Commission. Um, we had people who are in the determination process. That means they're in that appeals adjudication process that we're not getting payments, that we move people to payments um, in December as well to kind of to help support them uh, through this, this winter issues. And so I think that's alleviated some of the calls. A lot of times someone's in that appeals process, because it's a long queue, we're not sure, like tomorrow's your hearing 
or it's next month. And so we're working on better technology. The governor also, in his introduced budget, put uh, $9 million towards more customer service at the uh, Employment Commission, as well as $5 million to improve the technology to better communicate through portals. Thank you, Megan. I'm going to take one more question on the, on the uh, telephone, and then we'll wrap this up. Thank you. All right, so we'll go to Alicia Sowers now, Virginian pilot. Hi, thank you. Um, I just, I don't think um, I heard it uh, in terms of what the goal was uh, to have all Virginians who want it vaccinated. Is that by summertime, by the end of the year? And then the second question I have is, what is the threshold that you're trying to hit uh, before you're ready to begin expanding to the 1B priority group? Yeah, two two questions. The the goal is to have everybody vaccinated by this summer, and I think if we do the math uh, of fifty thousand uh, individuals a day, that's uh, what will get us to that that goal. Um, and your your other question, please. Uh, what is the threshold you're trying to hit uh, before you're ready to expand to the one B priority group? Yeah, no. That uh, so the the second question is what what are the uh, the criteria to, before we go from uh, 1A to 1B. And, and that will essentially be the work that Dr. Abula, Dr. Carey, Dr. Aller, and I will continue to communicate uh, with our hospitals and our long-term care facilities. When we're comfortable that the majority of those individuals have been vaccinated, uh, we'll move to 1B. And we may do that in some areas sooner than others because, uh, as you all know, some areas of Virginia are ahead of others. So uh, flexibility, uh, I think, is a good word as we move forward, and we're certainly going to be flexible and make sure that we get all of Virginia vaccinated. Thank you all so much for being with us today. I know there's a lot of news going on uh, in our country today, but to the press, thank you all for taking the time to be with us and to the viewers at home. Uh, we appreciate you being part of this as well, and we look forward to all working together and, as I said, get Virginia vaccinated as expeditiously and safely uh, as we can and uh, getting this pandemic behind us and getting back to our, our near normal. So thank you all. Stay safe and healthy, and we'll look forward to being with you soon. Thank you.